Today's show is brought to you by BarkBox.com. Get one free extra month of BarkBox at GetBarkBox.com slash amps. Neck throughs, guitars, they're like a guy that won't have a beer with you. I want to hear what's pushing the notes. Freddie King and B.B. King, Albert King, and let's not forget Burger King. I don't want to blow my knuckle out. Stainless steel is the work of the devil. These go to 11. From the East Amplification Tone Labs in Baltimore, Maryland, it's the Amps and Axes Show. With your hosts, Jeff the Godfather of Low Wattage Amps Bober and Mick Marcelino. Well, good day to you, Mr. Bober. Good day to you, Mr. Marcelino. How be you? Oh, hey, guess what, man? Um, Got to see our good friend, Mr. Speed, Mr. Michael Angelo Badio. Yo, that's right. You yeah, went. You I saw- went. Yeah, I took my son and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Michael is uh, he is an interesting guy. I mean, that is a guy that has he has to work for everything, you know, because it's not everybody's cup of tea. And true. uh, And he uh, I'm sure some people will tell you that. uh, Well, yeah. And yeah. But let me tell you, man, to witness it in person is uh, very interesting. Uh, you know, it, it's like, yeah. whoa. And, and, but here's the thing. Um, he does these medleys and he did one that was like Led Zeppelin. And, uh, mm. and I tell you what, I, I, wow. I like, I like how soulful that guy can get, man. He can, he's an older, That's... he's an older guy, right? Yeah. He, yeah. He, you know, and he's been doing this a minute. Yeah, and he's got that, you know, his influences were our influences. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you didn't start, he didn't start off at 800 miles an hour. You know, he had to learn any Elvis, huge, huge fan of Elvis. So, you know, he was learning Elvis tunes and then he was learning Led Zeppelin and Hendrix and all this other stuff. And let me tell you, man, he's, he's got that in him. And the speed thing and the double neck thing and all that, that is his show. You know, that's his mm-hmm. that's his show thing. But a very tasteful guitarist, when he pulls it back, he can. Re- and that's something that it, you, you I, don't you know don't, to expect. You do not, because there's a lot yeah. of guys that base their entire thing off of this one thing. And you never hear the other thing. You know, mm-hmm. it's always just full throttle go, you know, 400 miles an hour. All the well, time. you know, and, I, and I'm sure that some of the younger people in that style, um, there's a very good chance that they, well, there's a very good chance that they didn't start exactly. with the earlier stuff. Uh, yeah. And there is a chance that they never went backwards. It, and, you know, they you know, may listened. later on in life, you know right. what I mean? But uh, for, you know, well, hopefully so. Yeah, yeah. When they're 14 and, and, you know, they're, they're cutting their teeth or whatever, it's, uh, well, I got to play as fast as x y or z you know right so it was uh it was interesting and um and and a really good clinic and and our good buddy uh larry um noto Noto. uh he was over there and uh you know i got to chat with him and i did chat with michael and you know it was it's it was an interesting clinic and he you know it was a big of course dean it was a big dean push Mm -hmm. but here was the thing that was the most interesting he only travels with that double neck guitar uh, when he's doing these clinics. So mm-hmm. he had the double neck, but all the other guitars, all of his other signature models were owned by Musicland. Right off the wall. Right off the wall. Yeah. And the guy that I knew at the clinic, he bought one of them. <laughs> well, there you go. After the, after the thing, he bought it, had Michael mm-hmm. sign it. And I was like, oh, look at that. There you go. So yeah. very cool stuff. And I got to see a couple of my old friends over there that I haven't seen. My old guitar teacher, Vince Corson. And uh, that's oh, been nice. 30 some years. And, you know, it's just it was a really neat little homecoming. And my son got, you know, to 
to get exposed to some of that stuff. So it was it was pleasant. And thank you for uh, turning me on to it because I had no idea. Oh, wow. I, that was literally a half an hour decision before we got in the car and rolled out. <laughs> yeah. And I, I had seen it probably earlier, uh, a few days earlier, and, and it just didn't register. And then I had, I had seen, you know, the, the ad for it again mm-hmm. the, the day of. Yeah. And I went, wow, uh, I packed. can't go, but maybe uh, maybe Brother Mick wants to go. <laughs> it was it's like, oh, and man. Let me tell you, uh, if anybody, if he's coming around, go see it. You're not going to be disappointed. It's not going to be just him shredding. He gives a lot of information. Uh, you know, talks about the music biz, talks about the ups and downs that he's had. And cool. let me tell you, you know, he's when you're when you're walking around with a flamethrower, uh, you get more downs than you get ups, you know, and he but he was very grateful for everything that he's ever made. And, and he says, I've got a very nice house. He goes, I can't complain. He goes, I'm not a household name. He goes, but I, I can't complain about it because he goes, I got a really gorgeous place I live in. And he goes, and I do well. So, you know, hats off to him, man. Yeah, Especially absolutely. in this day and age. Jesus. He's he's making a living in the music industry, man. God bless. Yeah, as a you guitar know? player. As a guitar player. Yeah, and and a quite unusual one at that. Yes, yeah. yeah. Quite so unusual if one If you get at the that, chan- but, chance to check him out, definitely go do it. You won't you won't be disappointed. True, and true. on top of that, I want to thank everybody for kicking it up, man. The the uh you guys are really out there spreading the word because our numbers have reflected it and we can't thank you enough. That's right. And we can't do it without you. As we always say, we can't do it without you. And, you know, your brothers, sisters, you know, friends, aunts, uncles, husbands, wives, uh, other anybody that you can players. turn other other shredder guitar. <laughs> yeah, anybody you can turn on to us, you know, that it likes the innards of the music world yes. or even just likes music and would like to hear something outside of just the songs, you know, right. like what goes on. Um, we appreciate you turning them on to us. Yeah, and now here's the thing. We've had some interviews that we know are like some of the last of the, of the person's life, you know, like Larry Coryell, True. people like that, and 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 maybe even like uh, Elliot Rubinson, uh, the owner uh, that was the mm-hmm. owner of Dean, Dean Guitars, his mm-hmm. son Evan, who we're going to probably have on our show. Um, you know, yeah, he's y- taken over. You yeah. won't hear those guys again, and we were very close to one of their last interviews. So when you do tell your friends, you know, tell them that you heard it here first, man, because we try to do that. That's right. And we, we think you're going to hear something new. Uh, and for the first time again today, although our guest had, had come from a band that some of you might have known, uh, I a little <laughs> while ago, back in the day, Mick does. Um, but we're going to, we're going to, you know, bring you his new band as well which i think is really cool and you got to check out so it's i mean it's just it's good rock and roll man it's good rock and roll so we're going to take a pause for the cause what i said that's what it's all about that is what it's all (laughs) about that's right so we're now that's right we're going to take a pause for the cause come back with our guest of the week um guitarist for the new band underground thieves mr nick perry For our listeners only, BarkBox is offering an opportunity to receive one free extra month. What is BarkBox? BarkBox delivers four to six natural treats and toys curated around a surprise theme each month for your dog. All edibles are made in the USA or Canada, and 100% of the products are tested on their own animals. When you go to order, tell them how big your dog is. Then choose a plan. One, six, or 12 months plans are available, and you can cancel at any time. Bark boxes are shipped free on the 15th of each month. And if your dog does not like something in the box, we'll send you something they'll love for free because they're all about dog happiness. So to receive one month free, go to getbarkbox.com slash amps. Again, that's getbarkbox.com slash amps to receive an extra month of BarkBox for free. Hey, everybody, this is Ken House from Reverend Guitars, and you're listening to Amps and Axes. And we are back with our guest of the week, as promised, because we always keep our promises. Uh, Mr. Nick Perry of Underground Thieves and Silvertide. Nick, how are you? I'm great, guys. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's it's a pleasure to have you, man. And uh, thanks for taking the time. I know you're busy. You're you know you're on the road in one form or another. I'm sure. So um, 
we will uh, we will make this work as best possible. Well, so, I'm ready to rock. Thanks for cool, having man. me, and uh, I'm happy to chat. I love chatting about anything that relates to music or guitar in any way, shape, or form. Good, and that's that's great because we're going to get to all of it. Cool. So, <laughs> and, and and as always, I have a little bit of a story, and it's just a recent story because I okay <laughs> I just found out some information because I'm a bad host. But anyway, <laughs> um, back uh, some years ago, uh, I was given this album uh, by this band called Silvertide, and it was called Show and Tell. And I put it on, and I was like, "Wow, this is amazing." There's not a bad song on this album. And uh, and I was like, guitar playing is just, it's nuts. I mean, it's over the edge. You got a guy playing a, in like a single coil Telecaster, Stratocaster, and you got this other guy definitely like more on the humbucker side. But it's straight ahead stuff. I mean, it's, it's like wide cool. open marshals, you know, just it, rock and roll. And mm-hmm. it, was, it was really refreshing at that point in time because that album came out in 2004 and uh, and Nick, you were the lead guitar player, correct? In the band, correct. Okay, correct. And, so, I, so I was the humbucker guy. As yes, you just referred and, to. and okay. I got to see you guys open up for Tremonti, if I'm not mistaken. Alter and Bridge, perhaps. Alter Bridge, yes, that's correct. I'm sorry, I stand correct that's on okay. that. But uh, that was in Baltimore, Jeff, in a converted parking lot uh, down of uh, God, right there under, like underneath 83. In Baltimore, Maryland, and, okay. and I don't remember the name of the club, but it was like a parking garage that they kind of enclosed in the bottom, <laughs> and there was a band wow. in there, and uh, and these guys just crushed it, and I was, and and then all of a sudden they went away, you know, it was like they just they weren't around anymore, and I'm like, wonder what happened to those guys, you know, and uh, sure well, enough, we'll find out. If we're gonna find out the real story. <sighs> You there are. You go. <laughs> so let's let's like I always like to do, um, Nick. Let's let's start at the beginning. Uh, we're going to jump in the wayback machine and find out where Mr. Nick Perry was born and raised, and how you got into this wonderful, wacky, fantastic world of music, man. So give us some history. Okay. Well, I am from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Cool. Um, I was actually born in a town called uh, Cheltenham. Uh, Abington, that area, just outside of the city proper, but I went to school in the city, um, you know, lived in the suburbs and and various parts of that area. But, you know, I say I'm from Philly and it's pretty good, uh, pretty good assessment. Sure. Um, I was from a very early age. I remember being six years old and there was a rerun on. Remember those reruns on TV <laughs> Uh, of the Michael Jackson 25th anniversary Motown special or whatever it is. So oh, yeah. we're going back to like the late eighties and, uh, it wasn't live cause I, I believe it, that was actually filmed in, in 82. And this must've been, if I was six years old, it would have been 1990. So or, or around 1990. And I saw this thing on TV and I didn't know at that moment from guitar, bass, drums, whatever. I just saw Michael Jackson on TV and I said to my parents, I'm going to be on TV. That's what I'm going to do with my life. And that was a pivotal moment um, because, you know, 28 years later, whatever the math is, um, I'm still, I'm still, you know, in pursuit of that, in pursuit, not of being on TV. And I've been on TV many times and I'm very grateful for all the, for all the stuff that I've done and, and the opportunities I've had, but I'm still chasing down the, pursuit of a career in the arts you know in music and um more specifically so i was raised in kind of you know kind of a quintessential conservative household um i went to catholic school with a shirt and tie and the whole bit and i was not really exposed to rock music until i was probably about 11 or 12 years old my aunt my mom's sister, Terry, a.k.a. The Dode, is a true story. It was Thanksgiving of whatever year that was. Okay? And under the family table on Thanksgiving Day, you can't make this up, under the table, my aunt hands me two cassette tapes. One is ACDC, Highway to Hell, and the other one is Pearl Jam 10. Wow. And 
let me just tell you that it was life changing to say the least. Wow. Wow. And I've, I've never been the same person. <laughs> well, well, I've you, never been the same person. You know, Nick, that could have <laughs> went horribly, horribly wrong. It could have totally. went the other way, <laughs> you know, and uh, ruined you for life. So, uh, yeah, you know. I could be homeless. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> That's true. You know, it's, um, it's, it, it's all in how you look at things, you know, it's all in how you look yeah. at things. Well, I just, That's cool. I fell in love not only with rock and roll, but with the sound of the electric guitar. And to, to this day, I'm obsessed with the sound of an electric guitar. You know, it does something for me. It makes me feel a certain way that is hard to, you know, really specifically put into words other than it just gets under my skin and it makes me feel high. It makes me feel amped up, you know, in a really natural way. And my my memory is that I didn't even know what a guitar solo was called. I just knew that when I heard a guitar playing melody when I heard a guitar, you know, doing a ripping section of a song, I was like, that's it. Specifically, that is my calling. And, <laughs> you know, came to find out later that, yeah, that's a guitar solo. And, this is, you know, you know, that's Angus Young and all this stuff and blah, blah. But from that moment on, I knew what I was going to do with my life. And I've never really looked back. I've never really ever pressed pause. It's just been kind of full pursuit since that moment. So you decided that that's uh, so what you yeah. wanted to do. When did you pick up an instrument? It was your first instrument, a guitar. Yes, it was a guitar. Probably a month later, I convinced my parents to get me a guitar. As th cool. This was, I was 12 years old. And okay. um, I know that this may sound a little ridiculous, but uh, it just happened really fast. I just picked, just, you know, got into it in a big way and it, it spoke to me and and i i didn't really have trouble learning how to play it i'm not trying to sound like a you know like an ego guy but like it, it just there was some connection i can't explain and three years later i'm gigging four nights a week and silver tide is just starting in its infancy it was called vertigo uh prior to being called silver tide mm -hmm. and by the age of 16 you know, we are opening for Aerosmith and being flown around the country, um, wow. being Christ. wined and dined. <laughs> and there was this huge bidding war, this huge. I mean, it doesn't really happen anymore, but there was at the time still many major labels. This is before Napster and, and downloading and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And it was kind of the end of, you know, the end of the 90. I mean, th this is going back like 2001 ish. Um, and but it was still. Part of that decade, you know, the 90s excess where record labels were spending a ton of money and they had no fear and no worry of anything that was coming. Mm -hmm. um, so we we ended up signing a deal with Clive Davis. I was one month into my senior year. I ended up leaving my senior year to go out on tour with Alice Cooper. And, um, dude, I call it joining the circus, but it really was. <laughs> it was from the time I was 16, it was you know, on tour in Japan and on tour with Van Halen and Aerosmith and ZZ Top. And so you're, you know, was your first band Silver Tide? Correct. Damn. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. When I made that album, I, I, I was 18 years old when we recorded the album. Holy crap. Um, and it came <sighs> out when I was, I believe it came out when I was 19 or 20. Now, uh, now but we were young. We were all young. Now the, wow. the the first one came out in two thousand two, correct? Well, that that was an EP okay. called American Excess. Okay, because uh, that, show that and... came out in two thousand two. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But that, Show uh, and Tell was the uh, one and only album that we ever put out. Um, and I have it. And we toured. <laughs> well, thank you. It's still it's still a milestone for me of of you know of what that period was and and it was such a, like you know a time of innocence. We really didn't know a lot about the industry. We didn't know really about, you know, sort of the do's and don'ts. We were just so young, had no adult supervision, and were flying by the seat of our pants, literally just, you know, mm. playing music all day and partying all night. It was just a wild freaking ride. You wow. Know? You know, and, and like, you know, knowing nothing about the business and no supervision and 
you apparently live through it very well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it's it's Mick. Have we ever had a guest on whose first band uh-uh. like just <laughs> no. blew everything open? No, I don't think so. No. And so, I mean, you know, so many people, you know, they uh, they have they have high school bands, maybe a little little grammar school thing if they're mm-hmm. really lucky and get into it early. And then they got high school bands and then they're, you know, they're they're cutting their teeth and paying their dues in local clubs and all this kind of stuff. And then finally something breaks. But and and that happens to the lucky ones. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, Th- and this I don't think we've ever had somebody that right out of the gate was on a freaking plane opening on tours no and when i when i saw him i was like i you know the only thing i could compare the energy level on that stage to would be airborne today Uh i mean you guys were like on fire and especially you nick i mean i was like how in the hell is he able to play what he's playing just throwing himself uh, around on that stage like that i was like this is crazy it's you know, you know how you do that? You know how you do that? <laughs> I don't know. When you're 18 is how you do that. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, it was. I it, watched a lot of Angus Young <laughs> concert films as a kid. I was like, you know, having them for breakfast, uh, lunch, and dinner. Yeah, well, that would do it. I mean, uh, because, uh, you know, that that's that was exactly what it was like watching. I mean, you really couldn't even, like, see his face. You know, because it was hair and it was just all over the place. And you're going, I don't know what that guy's doing, man, but he is just killing it. So it was a, it now, was a very now, neat experience. That's cool. That's cool. Now, you're um, when you went out Thank on you. when you went out on tour, uh, I, I can't imagine that you went out with like your first guitar and amp. So, you know, what what were your first pieces of gear? And then how did that change when you were all of a sudden on these big stages? Sure. Um, no, you're, you're correct. Um, so when I was 12, my parents didn't think I was going to stick with it because I had tried. Um, I did martial arts for a while. I did soccer. I did baseball, basketball. You know, you're a kid. You're trying different stuff. And sure. So they thought that music was going to be a fad. And my dad, which I still thank him for to this day, he insisted that I start with acoustic guitar. He would not buy me an electric guitar. And in fact, my first guitar ever was a rent. My parents rented it. They didn't think I was even going to stick with it long enough that they should buy one. So I, they mm-hmm. rented me a nylon string classical guitar, which, you know, was the hardest thing in the world to play. But I played it so much and they realized that this was something I was serious about. So whatever the next Christmas was, you know, I, I got an acoustic guitar, steel string acoustic guitar, which I thought was incredible. Um, and, uh, but you know, with their knockoff guitars, it was nothing, nothing crazy. I, I eventually convinced them to get an electric guitar, which was a knockoff telly. And, you know, this is super early years, 12, 13, 14. I think when I was graduating eighth grade and at the time I was mowing lawns and I was throwing papers and doing everything I could to make money so I could, sure. um, you know, save for a car and, I thought if I if I could um, have a nice electric guitar and a nice car, I'd, I'd get some girls. And, uh, <laughs> Don't as, we all? As you do, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I still think that. So um, <laughs> anyway, I like um, that. So so I I scrabbled my lawnmower money, and my parents chipped in a few bucks for my graduation present. And when I graduated eighth grade, I bought slash they bought a Gibson SG standard in cherry, just like Angus's. Oh, had to have nice. It. There you go. So that that was sort of the first thing. And I played that guitar through all the early shows. I eventually got an, got another black SG that I played in the early days because we were gigging on South Street. It wasn't like we went from my bedroom to the Tweeter Center. It It, it was... You know, we started playing a residency on South Street, which is like the Melrose or the or Sunset Strip of L.A. to give yeah. people reference who don't, who don't know South Street. Um, so, you know, we started playing one night a week on this residency and then we were picking up other nights. And eventually it was four or five nights a week. And I was still a, a junior in high school and getting very little sleep and staying out with friends, um, you know, 
male and female friends and then having them drive me to school the next day. It, it, it was a little <laughs> bit of a crazy time. And, and um, so, so I'm getting off track. So when the band got signed, okay, we, again, this is, this is the time before, you know, the kind of crash of the industry. So it, it and, and there was a bidding war. So it was a big deal and we all made, you know, some money. So my parents were like, well, look, you can't spend all this money. It's ridiculous. You have to save it, put it in the bank. And I said, well, what if I save some of it and I invest some of it in, in gear and guitars and amps and stuff like that? So that's what I did. I bought, I bought quite a few guitars and amps. I bought a, um, a 71 Super Lead Marshall. I actually bought oh, a couple yeah. of them, but, but one of them in, in particular uh, that I used all the time and a, a 4x12 from the 60s. It was a tall cab, so you know, just a little bit really? taller than your average 412. Oh, um, nice. And I've got some photos and stuff I can send you guys. Um, and I occasionally post stuff from my, you know, on my Instagram of from all eras of, of my life. But, um, you know, I bought a bunch of guitars. I bought a bunch of Gibson Les Pauls and SGs. I bought a Flying V. I bought, um, you know, a couple Strats. And so I, I, I had the gear kind of, from very early on, I was pretty obsessed with gear and pretty obsessed with tone chasing, which I've never, I'm still chasing it. I was chasing it 10 minutes before we called, you know, we spoke <laughs> or the call started, whatever. Yeah. Um, so, so when we hit the road, I had, you know, I had a few nice guitars and a few nice amps and I was kind of off to the races and your ear assessment, Mick, um, was really good. So I was the humbucker guy. I was mostly playing Les Pauls and, and SGs. And then eventually, when I got into Johnny Winter, which blew my mind, you had the I old, had uh, to have a Firebird. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> I was playing Firebirds for a while. Um, but I was, the, I was the Gibson Marshall guy, and Mark Melchior was playing Tellies, and he was the Vox guy. So he was playing a Vox AC30, an old 62 Um AC30, wow. and, and I think he had a thin line telly and, and an Esquire. So it was the telly, Vox, Marshall, Gibson kind of uh, dynamic with Silver Tide. Pretty perfect. If that helps to answer. Yeah. 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 Wow. That is, it's, and and um, a 62 Vox. Wow. Um, that thing, let me tell you a story for everyone out there who thinks that. <laughs> there has to know, be a story with, with early boxes. <laughs> okay. Those things. Because he had two of them side by side. Those things were so loud. They, they were like twice as loud as my Marshall, okay? Because they're open back. So they throw sound. Yeah. You know, when you're playing a, a closed back cab, it's very, you know, unidirectional and um, contained. Whereas, you know, an open back AC30 on 10, we're not talking master volumes here. Like, to get them to right. rip, you had to crank them up. Right, right. So they were so loud that he had to have them facing the the curtain like he, he had to turn them mm -hmm. around he couldn't face the audience with those amps um but for anybody who thinks that you know marshall's you know are the loudest around or whatever the case may be like you know those ac30s were easily twice as loud as my plexis and super leads twice as loud any any major meltdowns with those because you know the early ones were that, no not, they were pretty not the most roadworthy I... really wow no, no, he, he did okay with them. I had problems with my Marshalls all the time. I was blowing <laughs> stuff up all the time. And I eventually, and this is a good segue into what I'm currently playing, because when we, so we made this show and tell record, we went out, we toured, and our a &R guy at the time said, hey, you know, you guys are great, the energy's great, but you've just made this record and the record's really good, and it's got a lot of layers. It's got a lot of singing. Like, you guys need to go spend a couple weeks with the producer of the record in a rehearsal room, and, like, you're not doing a good enough job interpreting the record live. We really want you to spend time on background vocals. We want you to spend time on nailing some of these overdubs, figuring out a way to homogenize the parts, to play a couple different things, to really get the quintessential parts of the record, which makes total sense and everybody knows to do that but again we were so young you know we didn't really you know we're just out there playing playing whatever our interpretation was but it could have been better so we ended up going for a couple of weeks back to LA to do like a post-production rehearsal 
to get our live show to sound as close to the record as we could. And in, in that time, the producer, Oliver Lieber, um, who did a great job producing the record, and he's a crazy gear guy, and um, he was seeing me with this Marshall dilemma and, and blowing these things up, and uh, one of them caught on fire, and I had a 200-watt Marshall Major that was so loud, it was like oh, we're on tour with Van Halen, <laughs> and my sound guy, the legendary sound guy known as Night Bob. Oh, yeah. Uh, so he's he's at front of house. We're in an arena. We're sound checking. And he, you know, he gets on the mic. So I hear him through the monitors on stage. And my Marshall major is like on two or three volume. And he just says, Nick, you're not even in the P.A. <laughs> i was like come on dude i can't even turn this thing down anymore it won't sound good so i i knew that i needed to kind of fix you know the deal this is kind of before attenuators and stuff obviously the very act but i didn't really wasn't hip to that at that point and mm -hmm. so oliver recommended to me this boutique amp i think it was one of the first you know more boutique companies that came out in the early 90s in michigan a guy named joe naylor started a company called naylor amps sure and Oliver, um, I knew he had one because I'd actually played um, on the record. The record was a lot of Marshall stuff, but there was some of this Naylor amp. I didn't know anything about it. I just knew that it sounded great. But when we did this post-production rehearsal thing, he brought in his Naylor and goes, dude, you need to just take a break from the Marshalls and run these amps. They're super reliable. You will never have a problem. And they can get any era of more because it's like a dual gain stage, so... If your gain is set low, you know, you're in Plexi territory, JTM 45 territory. As you kind of go up, you can hit kind of every era of JMP all the way up to JCM 800 and beyond. So um, mm -hmm. I was able to get the sound I wanted, number one, at a more manageable volume, but even more importantly, because I do like playing loud, so the volume wasn't the only thing, but it, it, it was super reliable. And, you know, from that moment on until today... So you're talking 15 years, I've been playing Naylor amps, and I've owned uh, many of them over the years um, in 60-watt versions and 38-watt versions, and I'm still playing the amps. They're just incredible, and knock on wood, I've never, ever had a problem with one, ever. Wow. Nice. Ever once. And there's some ever irony nice. here, because last yep. week, our guest was Ken Haas from Reverend Guitars, who is... Joe Naylor. Who? Joe Naylor. Yeah. <laughs> that is, that is awesome. I've never met him. I, I, I'd love to shake his hand and just tell him like, hey, dude, uh, you know, whatever you designed in your garage, you know, has like rocked my world for 20 years or whatever. But um, yeah, he, maybe was, one day. he was definitely one of the earlier guys, you know? Yeah. Uh, and they're, I, they're, 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 sorry, good. No, I was, you know, there, there was. It, there were guys that were you know, in in the amp world before him, like you know Diaz, Caesar Diaz was doing stuff. Um, um, you, uh, yeah. Gerald Kendrick. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, Gerald Weber from Kendrick, uh, Mike Soldano. You know, totally. all those guys were kind of out. We're all out about the same time, and you know, it's just blown up from that point. But sure. uh, yeah, yeah, well, that's Joe what I meant. I didn't mean that he was the too. first one, but it, it, we live in an era now where oh, you can yeah. get anything you can dream of. Someone's making, you know, a version of anything that you could ever imagine. Right. And, oh, yeah. And, right. you know, back then it was, you know, a handful of guys that were really, you know, it was a much smaller uh, market for boutique gear. Now, now my, my partner here, he's he's uh, he's very modest, but he was the designer and uh, part, I guess you were a part owner, right? Jeff or yeah oh yeah yeah of Buddha amplifiers, if you remember them. Cool, I and, do. And now he makes East amplification. So if you want to melt your face, you got to get a hold of his fifty watt <laughs> East. Well, you can melt your face at lower volumes. You too. can, it's you can, fine. you can it's melt fine. your face with the two water if you want. Uh, but uh, yeah, if I remember the quote correctly, um, Joe Bonamassa said that's the loudest fifty watt amp I've ever heard. Wow. Amongst his Killer. other 100-watt amps. <laughs> yeah, he, he said a few things. Yeah, a few yeah. people have said a few things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're very so, loud. Well, uh, they have yeah. great volume. <laughs> great. Well, I will, when, when, we, uh, when we hang up, I'll, I'll, I'll do a deep dive on, on your company, dude. 
Well, there you go. There you go. That that. Was, you know, I would welcome that. I would welcome that. Um, so where, uh, where we, we, we were, um, okay. We were at the, the gear, uh, you were in the studio doing pre-production, uh, and you got the nailers and the, vo- were the Voxes still hanging in there? Yep. Voxes made it through the whole run with Silver Tide. Um, and I, I switched over to nailers and like I said, I kind of never looked back, but we toured that record, um, you know, we toured that record for three years, nonstop. We had a few days off for Christmas each year, mm. and <laughs> it it really it hurt us. It it hurt us. It it helped in that we grew a loyal fan base that even now is still is still with us, and some of us as we've continued on, and we sold a lot of the records, and I'm very grateful for that. But we were overworked, and when people are that close together for that long, you know, it starts to you know, put a strain on relationships, especially if you're young and you don't have the experience of life to know, you know, mm-hmm. as you get older, you gain wisdom in that if you find out that something bothers someone, you know, you do your best not to do that thing. When you're young, you know, I don't know if you're allowed to curse on this show, but oh, yeah. you're, you're a dick, you're a <laughs> dick, <laughs> you know, and and you're like, oh, this guy doesn't like that. Let me do it again. And, <laughs> I think that's called and, testosterone. See, when you're totally. six, when you're 16, <laughs> it is it is running out of your hair follicles. It runs you. Yeah, I mean, that, you, you know, <laughs> if you know, when you look at, I always say, when you look at guys, when you look at people that do crime, there is actually uh, there there's like a number. <laughs> it's like 14 to like you know 27. And uh, that's where, you know, most guys just can't control their stuff. And, yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, you will, you know, it's like, hey, dude, that that hurt when you stuck me with that straight pin. And then you stick him four more times. You know, it, yeah. it's uh, but when you when you get in the 30s and all, you, you start to feel the pain, you know, <laughs> well, you know, what's you. what's what's the, Mick? What's the phrase that always comes up on this show when it comes to touring? Don't be a dick. Don't be a dick. Right. <laughs> Don't be a dick. Yeah, well, we were all dicks. <laughs> I mean, you know, look, that's not entirely true. We're, we're, we're all, I'd like to think, good-hearted people, um, and and none of us have malicious intention in mind oh. in any way. But but we grew up together. We went to high school yeah, together. Just so like a bunch of brothers. There, it was a bunch of yeah. It was stupid shit. It was brotherly love and and what you know when you pick on somebody that kind of thing yeah, yeah so sure. it wasn't out we, we we weren't you know dicks outward to anybody around us it was right. it was all internal between the five of us and relationships got strained and simultaneously there was this kind of coup that happened at the label and napster hit and everybody mm-hmm. lost their mind and um there was some you know i Looking back, there's a million things that went wrong. It was the perfect storm of things that went wrong. Mm. And I was 22 years old, and I woke up one day, and it was over. The ride was over. You know, the band was done. We were dropped, which is crazy to sell 300,000-plus albums and and lose your record deal, but it happened. Wow. And, um, you know, talk about, you know, I have no life skills. I, I dropped out of high school. You know, I'm 22 years old and I have no idea in the world what to do. Mm. I'm sitting in Philadelphia and I had no idea what to do. I knew I had to keep playing guitar. That's about it. But um, it was gnarly. It was like the rug got pulled out from under us, you know. Oh, yeah. wow. So if that answers you know, your question, why we went away, that's why we went away, yeah. more or less. Wow. It, just the record business in general. And it's like, yeah. you know, I was... I was I was you know drop jawed with the the quick success that you guys had, but this is the exact other side of it. Oh yeah, dude, boom, totally. done. Yeah, like, totally. Wow, and, and, man. And the irony behind that is, if you sold three hundred thousand units today, you're doing really well. Oh, <laughs> dude, Muse sells three hundred thousand albums. You know, in America, <laughs> yeah. it's like they're the biggest rock band oh, yeah. in, in 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 the world. So it's. A totally different time. It just, you yeah, know, yeah. It, it really puts it in perspective to where we're yeah, at, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, I am, 
you know, from what I was seeing, I imagine that you did a bunch of work with other artists before uh, Underground Thieves came to be. Yeah, so I'll, I'll sum it up pretty quick. Um, and, you know, if people want more of the backstory, they, they can certainly go search it out. But um, I, I moved to L.A. Um, when I was 22. Um, I slept on a friend's couch. I was just trying to figure out my life and what I was going to do. I, I was fortunate fortunate enough i did land a gig playing guitar for perry farrell mm. pretty pretty quick into it like three months into my la adventure and that kind of gave me the confidence you know that i was gonna have you know that it wasn't a fluke with silver tide that it wasn't you know that, mm. I, that I had something to offer yeah because you know when, when you're young you know and you know we all have insecurities and we don't know sometimes our ass from our elbow so you know, you're just figuring stuff out as you go. So it was a good shot in the arm that I needed. And I toured with him for about a year, you know, playing all the James Addiction stuff. It was a true honor. I loved the experience. I then joined a band called Shinedown and um, toured with them for a year all yeah. over the world, 40 countries and all this stuff. Yeah, they're um, a little known band. <laughs> yeah, a little Yeah, bit. little band. And I love all those guys, but truthfully... The reason I left both, um, and again, you know, uh, you're just, you know, growing as a, as a person, as a human being, um, and finding yourself and figuring out what you want to do and what you don't want to do. And ultimately, I realized for me to be fulfilled creatively that I had to be playing my own tunes. I'm, I've always been a songwriter. I wrote or co-wrote, you know, everything that Silver Tide did. I wake up every day, I write songs. For me, it, and I'm not you know, looking down on anybody else who's a hired gun, it's, everybody has a different path. And I think it's all amazing for anybody who can make a living playing music in any capacity. I have respect for it. But for me personally, I, I have to be writing, I have to be playing my own songs in some form or another, you know. So um, over the years, even since then, I have done collaborations with people. I played for a little while with Matt Sorum from Guns N' Roses and Velvet Revolver. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I've done stuff with my sister. My sister during this time kind of blew up and became a huge pop artist completely independently of this whole story, um, wow. which is pretty crazy. Her name's Christina Perry, if anybody wants to look her up. Um, she had songs on Twilight. and Wow. She's done really well. She sold like 20 million albums, Jesus. Um, which is <laughs> mind-blowing. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Pop is just a whole other world. I'm very proud of her. Oh, yeah. She's done very well, and I've, I've done some stuff with her. But, you know, it, I, I kind of had to go full circle. And when I, um, I, I, I tried to get a couple other original bands off the ground, but, you know, it's hard. It's really hard. And I learned yeah. just, you know, like you said, things came on pretty quick. It's not like, you know, we didn't pay any dues. We, we did slug it out in the clubs for, for, you know, a couple years while I was still in school. But, but relatively, like you said, Silver Tide got success pretty early on. And um, if I thought there was going to be a repeat performance of that, I was, you know, <laughs> in for a, a rude awakening. <laughs> so um, I had a couple, of, you know, a couple other bands that, that um, I thought were great, but just couldn't connect uh, and get to the next level. And then when I was 30, when I hit 30 a few years ago, I became a dad in the same month. And that was kind of my crossroads moment of just like, look, I need to get back to doing what I do and not give a crap about anything else. Like bluesy rock and roll, 60s and 70s inspired rock music, guitar music, you know, with, of course, great melody and great songs leading the charge but stuff inspired and that comes from that that vein that's where my heart is and i don't care if it's cool in fact it wasn't cool even when silver tide was it was 2004 what so you had limp biscuit and britney spears like it wasn't cool then <laughs> but right but i have to do it i have to pursue my what's in my heart regardless if it makes money if it brings me success i'd much rather play to you know 500 people a night and play what i love than play to 50,000 and and be putting on some facade and be you know doing something because 
I think it could make money or be successful or whatever. So, well, you know, and you're, there's like this little weird thing that's happening right now. And it's a good weird thing because you got bands like Tyler Bryant and the shakedown and you got Greta Van Fleet, and you know these guys are doing that. Blackberry thing. Smoke, yeah, well, rival Blackberry Sun. Smoke. We've sure. had we've yeah. had Blackberry. We've had uh, both Charlie and uh, and uh, uh, God Paul Jackson. Paul. Paul. Yeah, Paul. we've had both of them on, and uh, yeah, man. I mean, you know, that is the you. Me and Jeff always say this. It, it's a very refreshing thing because there's. You know, there's very defined defined lines in a lot of music, um, even though, you know, they'll give it titles that don't make any sense, you know, uh, but of what it is. But there there really is like, you know, this huge metal surge that takes place. But these guys have to play, you know, festivals for, you know, 80,000 people in Germany. Um, you got the pop world, which that is a whole nother land that, you know, it, it, you never know what's going to be going and what isn't. And then country is just like a whole nother story because those guys are like NASCAR. Cause it's like, right. No, right. Yeah. You, you don't know anybody that watches it, but it's the biggest thing on television. You know, and, and you're going, <laughs> you know, and you're just like Who's buying these records. Who are these people? Who in the fuck right. are these people, man? <laughs> you know, it's like it, it. It's pretty unique. Now, I'm not busting on country music at all. I I like a lot of that stuff, but it is it is one of no, those I things know, that that's a whole world. You know, that's their own. Yeah, that that's their own thing, man. And they were not about to go away. And boy, they were really good at it. Um, but the rock and roll side is the side that. You know that that's the piece, man. That that is the I don't know what you would call it the the juice that made this country, <laughs> and uh, yeah. it, it is kind of like the eight track tape, but it is some of the most purest music that is out there. Even and in, in, in today's standards, absolutely the most purest. You know, and I, I I'm just I'm just hoping um, that at some point we see a machine behind it because there's a machine behind country music. There's a machine oh, behind yeah. pop. Yeah. You know, yeah. all of that. I just hope that, you know, I mean, God, I, I, I hope it's, I hope it's underground thieves, you know, but somebody <laughs> yeah. Yeah. has something that starts to break big enough that this, these machines go, Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, this, because yeah. uh, there's, there's not a lot of push because there's no record companies anymore that that used to get behind all really good bands with good musicians and good songwriters and good vocalists and everything mm -hmm. there's just this machine that's behind things that uh, are popular and make money today yeah and that's that's, that's exactly that's exactly well said and exactly true it's all they care about so yeah. i'm i'm hoping that at some point something turns the corner in guitar world in 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 rock and roll music uh, with real musicians and real vocalists that somebody says, man, this stuff, I think this stuff's going to catch on, man. Maybe we should put well, some money behind it. You know, and that, and that's the thing, man. It's like, you know, there's a couple bands, you know, I've said it many times, like Airborne, they they are, you know, they do very well over in Europe. I mean, Europe seems they to They do be well, but there's nobody on the caliber of, of you know, the machines. There's oh, nobody backed by the machines no. that, that are backed behind the pop and the, and the country. Oh, absolutely and not. No. I, it's, and it's a little disheartening for people like us that love sure. real rock and roll music. Yeah. You know, well, with, it's with disheartening people that for people play. Who, who, who are making it and want to make a living doing it. You know, yeah. it's, it's right. tough. It's well, tough. Especially it's, when you're dealing a with a guy that has a computer and he's playing EDM. Right. That's even a whole nother world that, uh, you know. And he's getting paid way more than 95% of the bands out <laughs> oh, there. Oh, he is so getting he is getting serious bank. You kidding me? Skrillex, uh, God only knows what that kid makes. You know, that that guy that yeah. died the other day, uh, that that jock or that disc jockey that or that D, whatever the hell he is. The kid that died the other day, he made national news and because there was like some question about his death. But that kid was pulling in crazy money, and he would oh, yeah. show up at a festival, and there'd be 60,000 people there. Oh, yeah. And I'm going, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> there's insane. not even a musician. Right. <laughs> yeah, there's I mean, that. It's just the craziest let's, thing, man. Let's, go, let's get back to musicians, because I want to find out how, how Underground Thieves came to be, because yes. uh, I just did a little research on you guys before, you know, of course, before we did the interview, and um, I'm, I'm your newest fan. 
Ah, so, thanks, man. So, so tell me how that came to be. Well, long story short, you know, at this point in my life, you know, I've I've done a lot of things. I, I've been in a lot of bands, and the truth is, I don't want to start over anymore. I, I I wanted to create something that could kind of be an umbrella that I could use to collaborate with people. And I had this idea for a long time to do a big band, like minimum eight pieces. I just want to hear a lot of music on stage. I want it to sound like the Eagles or like Sly and the Family Stone, where you just hear, you know, four or five part harmonies, Leslie or, uh, you know, B3 and Leslie mm -hmm. and, and obviously guitar, bass and drums. And I just wanted a bigger band. I'm, I'm absolutely in love with the Tedeschi truck band oh. and <laughs> that that was definitely you know an influence for saying like okay you know if they can do it and make it work with an 11 12 piece band you know then I can do it too and, so and I I love when those guys do covers like old Delaney and Bonnie stuff like oh, that yeah oh, oh my yeah. god man they are so good at it well, I told I you they, that that alien ship landed years ago, and he got off. Of it. <laughs> he got off right, dude. <laughs> he is, dude. There's, there. I don't know that anybody could dispute that he is the greatest slide guitar player alive today. Like, there's nobody that is even in the same stratosphere. No, no, as, yeah. as, it, it, it's, as Derek Trucks. It, it's, it's, it's insanity at its best because nobody can do it except for him. <laughs> well, you mentioned Blackberry Smoke, Charlie. Charlie Starr is one of my best oh, friends. Oh, yeah. He's a great um, guitarist. And we, we talk all the time. And, you know, every third conversation is about, like, oh, shit. Did you see the <laughs> thing that Derek Trucks just posted? <laughs> you know, we just can't get over it. We're both in awe of this guy. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's equal parts inspiring and equal parts frustrating. Because, right. yeah. you know, it's, he, he's just on another level. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to see a human being tap into something um, – you know, that's almost spiritual, it feels mm -hmm. like. So um, good for him. So yeah. uh, back to the thieves. Uh, I wanted to do a big band and I wanted to, you know, I've to, to be honest and I'm, I'm divulging a little more than you'd see in a press release or a bio or whatever. But but truthfully, um, I have felt like I've been held back at certain points by um band members who weren't necessarily on the same page and when i say on the same page i'm not just saying that as like a off the cuff remark i mean to be in a band which is a marriage which is a four five i mean being married to one person it has its challenges being married to four or five people is incredibly hard and unless each person in the relationship has the same end goal has the same destination if you will then it's doomed and I, I've experienced so much drama and so much stuff with bands that I didn't really want to lock myself into, okay, here's another band with four people. And if anybody leaves, then it's the end of the band. Like, I, I can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do it anymore. So I had this idea that we're going to let the songs dictate, you know, who's involved in this thing. Because I've, I've made a lot of friends over the years. And, you know, there's definitely symmetry between the people i've i've chosen to come together and collaborate and we're you know we all love the same kind of stuff there's a lot of overlap um so it's not like you're going to see somebody coming from left side you know i'm not at least at the moment considering you know bringing a rapper into this thing so it's like <laughs> you know everybody's got the soul blues um earthy you know idea in their brain because that's what I love and that's what all my friends love and that's what we want to do. So the idea was to create kind of a big family band and from song to song to song, we're releasing one song per month. We're calling them chapters, we're releasing one chapter oh, nice. per month for every month of the year. And each chapter there, there are people who will be on all 12 chapters this year, but um, like the Eagles, we're playing to the strengths of the song. And so if this song is sung by, you know, Don Henley, and this song is sung by uh, Glenn Fry, and this one's Randy Meisner. Like, you know, it was still all the Eagles, mm -hmm. but yeah. that's kind of the model for the Underground Thieves. So each song, on a case by case basis, you know, someone's going to sing lead, and whether that's Walt Lafty, who, by the way, I'm reunited with for the first time since Silver Tide, which is incredible, awesome, and Brian Weaver, 
also from Silvertide, is on bass. So it's the first time the three of us are together since Silvertide, and, and they're part of the Underground Thieves. Now, Walt but is the K- uh, keyboard player? Walt's the lead singer. Well, he was the singer of Silvertide, and he's singing lead on many, not all, but many of the chapters of the Underground Thieves. Oh, okay. okay. So he sang, he sang lead okay. on the second single, called Everybody Wants One. And he's singing lead on the fourth single, which is coming out uh, in May. So um, the idea is that, you know, it's going to be a little bit of a rotating thing, but we're playing to the strength of the song. So if, if Walt's not on lead vocals, like on chapter one, he wasn't on lead, but he's on background. Because my buddy Sal is singing lead on that song because his voice felt like it was best for that song. Another great example is the band, the band, the band, you know, mm-hmm. they some songs Levon would sing, some right. songs Rick Danko, Danko would sing. Sure. Yep. So so that's the idea is a kind of a big family band. And um, over time I believe this will allow me to bring people in who I feel are right for the song. If I want to pedal steel on a certain song, I'm gonna call somebody to come in and play pedal steel. If I want uh, you know, horns on a song, which I definitely are already in the works, um, songs that have horn parts and you know, I can bring people in and give people an, an experience of, of like, this is a, a gang. It's a, it's a, it's a gang. I'm calling it a gang of misfits from the Southern California desert, but that's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's this gang of people that are coming together to make music and hopefully make people feel good, you know? And, and that's really all I want is to make people feel good with music. There's enough shit going on in the world. that's heavy and dark, you know, I want to I want to make people feel good and I'm not saying that all the songs are super happy sounding but I'm just I want to move people with music in a positive way and I want the thieves to be the vehicle for that you know That is awesome that is a that's a fantastic concept I mean you could have just called it you know the Nick Perry project you know because that's in essence what I guess it is at the core but uh, you know it put a name on it too it, it's equally as good and you know it's it's probably a you know um, uh, a little less egocentric, I guess, which is is probably the way you want it. Yeah, you know exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. yeah, and I like um, I uh, what I had what did I hear before? I, oh, I have a uh, Graveyard Moon. Yeah, that's the cut I listened to really quickly. Uh, I man, I love that song. I have to go listen to more stuff. I have to buy more stuff. But man, that thing's got got like a black crows kind of feel to it and uh who, who's singing that so my buddy sal uh his his name his stage name is the brother sal and he's an incredible pianist organ player and singer right and, so he does keyboards um, on that too yeah yeah he's playing he's playing organ and playing um piano and hmm. cassidy catanzaro is an amazing female singer and friend of mine. And she is singing the female lead part in that song. It's, it's really, it's, it's not a duet, but, but there's no. moments where there's a lead female lead vocal. That's Cassidy. There's moments where there's a male lead vocal. That's Sal. And then there's moments that they sing together. Right. And there's all harmonies, singing, male and female front parts. Yeah. Yeah. And all of us are singing. I'm singing Brian singing and Walt Lafty from Silvertide. He's singing background. Um, there's another woman incredible her name is lauren victoria from bakersfield she's singing background and um and yeah it was just this song that i've had in my back pocket for a few years and i thought it was special and i wanted to lead the gate you know come out of the gate with it and i know it's not an obvious choice you know most people would think you come out swinging with a three-minute rock song and we actually chose to put that three-minute rock song out as the second single but i wanted to come out with something different and this is like, you know, a seven, six and a half minute kind of opus, if you will. It's got this whole piano outro. It's got a two minute long guitar solo at the end that really crescendos. And, Damn. It's great. And, I love it. And, you know, I was listening to the vocals and like the vocals are starting to remind me a little bit of like a uh, little Chris Cornell, Richie Kotzen ish, oh, which I am a huge fan of. And, you know, not that he sounds like him, but it's it's in that vein. It's similar. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the female vocals. um, She's actually way better, and this is not a dig on anybody, but, you know, in the beginning when she started, not when she goes full-blown vocals at the end, but in the beginning when she's doing, like, harmonies and stuff, there was a little, like, Patti Smith in there. Yeah. It's like, 
man, this is this is good stuff. This is really good stuff. And yeah, of course, the guitar solo is. Just, I mean, that's that's my wheelhouse there. I absolutely <laughs> love that stuff. And and three thirty five for that solo, huh? Yeah, man. I got yeah. I got a three thirty five, and I, I don't want to say, you know. I, I'm not going to play anything else ever again. I, I, I'm still playing other stuff occasionally, but it's so hard. Like, this is my analogy. So if you so you can pick up any guitar, a Strat, a Les Paul, whatever, Telly, and play it, and go to a, and go to a 335, and that transition is fine. But it's so hard if you pick up a 335 or any semi hollow guitar, and you're playing it loud volume, and it's vibrating against your body, mm -hmm. you come feel like you're one with the note. Yeah. It's so hard to then pick up a guitar after it. You know what I mean? And so yes. I started playing the 335, and I'm just like, man, every song I, I, I'm going to the 335. It's I think that <laughs> that's going to be the voice of this of this band. Um, like I said, on the third single, I'm playing a Strat. Um, I will play other guitars on other songs as need be, but I, I think the majority of them will end up being the 335 i'm just connecting to it in a way that feels right right now it feels it feels like more of an extension of me than any other instrument i own cool very cool yeah it um sounds great man it's just that the i gotta i gotta buy some i gotta buy this music <laughs> well I, uh, I really sp enjoy speak it speaking of which uh nick you you have to have a website go ahead and throw it out there sure so it's undergroundthieves.com all right. And on all the social media stuff, it's, you know, backslash underground thieves. Um, and uh, yeah, we're out there. So every it, song that's coming out. Sorry, Ged. I was just going to say, is that on your website? All the all your social and all that, right? Totally. Everything's on underground thieves dot com. And I would encourage people to sign up for the mailing list because even more so uh, nowadays, we're using that a lot and we're sending out notifications and okay. tickets and, and and stuff early to people who are on the list are getting it before social media is getting it as yeah. kind of a you know incentive to be part of our our team awesome so, sure. uh, well we're going to put that link for your website on the show and that's going to live in perpetuity that's right and when, and it's going to stay in the archive when you go out and you check out the show make sure you go to amps and access.com and you can click on that and then spread some love over there because it sounds like he's going to need a huge tour bus for all these people. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. You know, yes, we are. <laughs> it, this band is obviously out there to to do the biggest and best job that it can possibly do, um, and it takes a little extra money to do it that oh, way. Hell yeah, it does. So support, especially the tour. as Hammonds. You got to carry one of those damn things around. You may as well forget about it. <laughs> oh, oh man, totally. Well, we're. Um, we're excited. We are, we're playing our first um, few shows in a couple of weeks. I'm actually heading to rehearsal right now. Um, we have our first show ever in New York City. We're headlining a place called the Cutting Room. Right. And then we're playing in Philadelphia at the Ardmore Music Hall. That's May 10th and 11th. Those are our first two shows. Then we're going overseas to play in the UK. And then I think we're going to do some West Coast stuff in the fall. And, but a lot of this year is studio. A lot of this year is studio. My, my plan was to get as much music out. I don't want to make people wait for music. Um, I was in a band before this, and, and there was a debacle with the label, and the record was held hostage and all this and that, and people had to wait for a long time. And I, with this, I just wanted to lead with music. So here's music, here's music, here's music, here's music, and give as much music, you know, put as much music as we can out there. I think most of 2019 will be you know, on the road, but at least for this year, you know, we are going to play some shows. We're going to have some fun on stage uh, awesome. and get that going, but it's going to be a, a lot of studio and a lot of music releasing, which hopefully people are, you know, are excited about. Hell yeah, man. Well, I'm, I'm really excited because there is the chance because we were planning on going North the, um, the weekend that you guys are actually doing those two shows. And there is a snowball's chance that I'll see you in Philly. Look at that. Well, Philly is my hometown, and it's going to be off the hook. I bet. Oh, it's going to be off the hook. We're playing the Ardmore Music Hall, which is a really Damn. cool venue. Um, it gets really great acts through there. I think George Clinton was just there um, nice. last week. It's, it's a really cool room. 
and it's you know one two three four five six of our hometowns so Sweet. it's that's going to be the one to uh if wow. you can make it man love to have wow. you Very email cool. me and let me know email me on- sure yeah sure absolutely um cool awesome awesome <laughs> Well, I, I think we've covered all the bases, and uh, oh. I have a feeling uh, I have a feeling uh, we'll be uh, speaking again. Oh hell yeah! So Anytime. I'm, I'm I'm looking for this to go far, man. I just I really enjoy this band. Well, thank you, and and I'm down anytime, and maybe if we speak again, there'll be more tunes out, and we can go through. Uh, you know, if if any of the amps and axes change up, and uh, and and how it develops, because you know I don't have a plan as far as. Um, you know, I, I follow the muse, which is who knows yeah. what it is. It, it's it's either a voice in our heads that you know changes day to day, or it's you know from the ether or wherever. But I'm I'm chasing, I'm following the muse, and wherever it takes me, I'm going. So um, I think they'll 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 be more to share as this thing unfolds. Well, I hope you have a wonderful trip, man. Yeah, man. Thank you very you know, much. I hope it's long and successful. Yes, sir. Thank you. And there you have the story. Okay. So uh, the, here, here's Bad Pad Podcaster Mick. <laughs> Look, I, no, I, it's all good, man. I it's admit all, good. all my faults. And believe me, if you want to hear them, we don't have enough fucking hard drive space. <laughs> so it, uh, you guys just line up and I'll just, you know, you can just email me. Uh, I totally uh, have been so cranked up with my normal day job that I totally didn't even get to look at his thing. And I was, no, no, I, you know, and it was one of those things. And then when I, I found out he was in silver tide, I'm like, what the hell? Cause right? I was a huge, you know, I, huge fan of that band. And I'm usually the one that doesn't have a lot of R D time. <laughs> well, you know, Hey, search time, you know, so, um, I'm, I'm glad that I did because I, you know, once I looked in, I went, man, oh. Badass, I dude. really dig this, yeah. man. I really dig this. I Bad, can't wait. Badass to crew over there, man. Let me tell Absolutely. you, you, you guys got to go back. You got to find that Silver Tide album. That is a kick-ass mm-hmm. album, man. You won't regret it. I guarantee it. And just what a nice guy, you know? Yeah, totally, man. Totally. Yeah, that, that uh, that's a cool story. And, and you know, we're going to have to, ha- like you said, we'll have to have him back on because I'd like to see that actually succeed. You know, and anything that we can do to help that and perpetuate that, then absolutely. You know, and he's close. He's not far away from us. You know, he's he's right up right. the road there. So that's that's a beautiful thing. Well, he's originally from there. Yeah, he might yeah. Still be in LA. Eh, it could be in L.A. Yeah. But, it's expensive to live out there, you know. It, it is. He should yeah. move back to. Yeah, hell yeah. Philly. <laughs> move back to Philly. <laughs> So, well, you know, well man, there you go, man. That's a there beautiful that thing. Was, I got the story. How about it. that shit? There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> now you know. Now I know. Now you know. That's right. So until next time, my friend. When one or both of us will know more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mick Marcelino. That's right. Uh, still Jeff Bober. And we're always saying. Onward. Be sure and follow the show on Twitter, at Amps and Axis. Also, make sure you like the show on Facebook. For news, comments, and everything else, visit the webpage, AmpsAndAxisCast.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.